people living in poverty around a wilderness area. The aim when we began this program, perhaps if we help these people, help them to improve their lives, they will become our partners in conservation. And that has proved to be true. So it's new farming methods most suitable to this very degraded land, ways of restoring the habitat, uh, sorry, ways of restoring overused farmland without the use of chemical pesticides and fertilizers, uh, water projects, protecting the watershed, allowing trees to grow back on the steep-sided valleys so that once again the streams can run pure, they were all getting silted up. Better health, better education done with the local authorities. And we started this way because instead of going into the village as a bunch of arrogant uh, foreigners and saying, we're really sorry for you, you're having a tough time, and we think this is the best thing to do to make your lives better, we had a team of Tanzanians, local ones, go in and sit down and listen to what they felt would help them the most. And to start with, it was nothing to do with conservation. It was all about growing more food, better health, and better education for their children. So that's where we began. And then we introduced what I think was the most, um, one of the most effective of any uh, program that we introduced, and that was microcredit for basically women based on the Grameen Bank. And women can come and take out tiny loans for projects that must be environmentally sustainable. And so uh, gradually the people's lives began to improve and gradually they came to completely agree that in making the environment better for the chimps, it was making it better for their own children and in Tanzania, every village is required to make a land management uh, use plan, which mostly they can't afford. And they are required to put 10% of that land, village land, into some kind of conservation status. So we managed to get the funding for them to make their plans, first for the 12 villages around Gombe. And they all agreed to put their 10% into a band so that all around the back of Gombe, and this is Gombe you see on your right hand side, um, now these bare slopes are covered with trees, some of which are already 30 foot high. And there's the beginning of a leafy corridor moving to where there are other chimpanzee groups outside the park, so once again there can be genetic exchange. So it's worked. But across the rest of Africa, we still have the constant destruction of the forest. Foreign logging companies moving in, opening up forests previously inaccessible, and what used to be subsistence hunting, getting food to feed yourself and your family, which has kept people alive in forested parts of Africa for hundreds of years and the rest of the world too. Now it's become a trade, it's become commercial. The bushmeat trade is the commercial hunting of wild animals for food. And they will go in on the logging trucks and they will shoot anything. Elephants and gorillas, chimpanzees, monkeys, antelopes, birds, bats, anything that can be uh, smoked and then put on the trucks and driven into town where the urban elite will pay more for it than they will for chicken or goat because they say it's part of their culture. But it's completely unsustainable. Mothers are shot. As a result, the infants are orphaned. They can't survive on their own. The hunter can't sell them for meat. There's not much meat on a baby chimp. And so they're uh, sold at the side of the road or in the markets. And we persuaded the government to confiscate them because it's actually illegal. Chimps are endangered species. Then we have to care for them, which is expensive. And we have the largest chimpanzee sanctuary in Africa, this one here. We now have 150 orphan chimpanzees who have to be fed and looked after. We hope to put some of them back in the wild, but I don't know. And then I think perhaps one of the most shocking experiences was when I first visited a medical research lab and realized that these close relatives of ours could be shut up for 40, 50 years in a five foot by five foot bleak cage. 
and looking into the eyes of one of these prisoners, thinking of the chimpanzees at Gombe. And it was a, a defining moment in my life. At any rate, <clears throat> one thing the chimpanzees have definitely done is to show that there isn't a sharp line dividing us from the rest of the animals. That we're not the only beings with personalities, minds, and feelings. And we are part of and not separated from the animal kingdom. And once you start thinking like this, and then thinking of ways we use and abuse <clears throat> so many animals, <clears throat> it is a bit shocking. Keeps me awake some nights. I began traveling around the world talking about the plight of chimpanzees and rainforests and learning more about the plight of the people living in Africa, the poverty and the disease and the ethnic violence, realizing that the same kind of thing was going on <coughs> in many of the other developing countries, realizing as I began talking more and more in Europe and America, North America and Asia, some of the other problems, you know these problems, but they're pretty grim. So we are poisoning the air, the water, and the earth with our chemicals. We know that there's shrinking water problems. You have water problems here. But even in countries where there used to be much water, those water supplies are shrinking. The underground aquifers are drying up. The surface water is disappearing. We know that the sea is becoming more acidic and that it's losing its power to absorb CO2 from the atmosphere. We know how we're releasing massive amounts of CO2 into the atmosphere through our reckless burning of fossil fuel. And we're also, as more and more people want to eat more and more meat, creating more and more methane gas which is contributing enormously to climate change. So we know all these things. We know that while we have dinner tonight, there will be millions of children going to bed hungry. And here's the big question. I've talked a lot about the similarities between chimpanzees and humans, but we're obviously different. Chimpanzees haven't invented microphones, either working ones or not working ones. <laughs> We've sent people to the moon. Chimpanzees have been launched into space, but they can't launch us into space. And I think if they could, we would hope we never came back. But they can't. So to me, the biggest difference is this explosive development of our intellect. And I personally think it's because sometime during our long evolutionary trail, we got this power of, of spoken language. So I can tell you about things you've never seen. And if I do it right, if we have time, I can do it in such a way that you can visualize what I'm talking about, perhaps. We can teach our children about things they've never seen. We can make plans. I could make plans to come back here in five years to Abu Dhabi and see what's changed since I was here now. And we can also take lessons from the past. But perhaps the most important thing we can do with this extraordinary intellect, there's a God-given power of speech, is to have discussions. We can bring together people with different backgrounds, with different sets of knowledge, and put them to discuss a problem, and unbelievable solutions can emerge. So here's the question. How is it that, without doubt, we are the most intellectual being that's ever walked planet Earth? So how come we're destroying it? It is our only home. What's happened? And I think we've lost something called wisdom. The wisdom, particularly I've seen in the indigenous people, who would make a decision today only after asking how will this decision affect our people generations ahead. And we're making decisions based on how will it help me now, me and my family now, maybe me and my country now, or how will this affect the next shareholders meeting three months ahead. And so do you think there's been a disconnect between this very clever brain and the human heart, in the poetic sense of the heart, 
love and compassion.